Caution. Hold up. Construction zone. Do you know what the word construction means? What does it mean? Think about it. Construct. Ah, that's what I thought. I knew you would know it. Yes, you are building something. This is the construction zone. Be careful. Be cautious. Creativity at work. So we are talking about building a little bit today. Um, I wanted to talk to you about you being an animal architect today. What does the word architect mean? Think about it for a second. You may have heard that word before. Architect is a person who designs buildings. And we know what designing is. You're thinking about things. You're being creative. Um, you are imagining. And once you start imagining when you design, you're going to implement that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Sometimes you oversee the construction. That means kind of you're the boss. You're making sure they are doing this work to your specification. Today, you are going to be the architect, and you're going to be an animal architect. Think about that for a second. What does that mean? How are you going to be an architect? How are you going to design a building, a home, for an animal? Lots of steps, lots of process. Um, so let's think about that. What do you need to know before designing um, a building? What are some things? Think about that in your head. You can say them out loud, or what are some things you probably need to know before designing a building? Have you thought about it for a second? Well, if we're going to be an animal architect, you probably need to know what animal. And honestly, if you have a few favorites, I would jot these down on paper, or if you have a chalkboard, or some other way that you can. Um, think about that, and we're going to go uh, into this further in a minute. But what animal um, are you going to be designing a home for? And architects have to think about where they're going to be building, who it's for, um, who's the customer. In our case, it's going to be a specific animal. Uh, you're going to need what know what they need. In your home, you have things like a place to sleep. You have a place to hold your food. You have a place to prepare your food. You have a place to relax and have fun. Um, and so we're thinking about lots of things. If we're talking about an animal, we're probably going to talk about their habitat a little bit. We're going to talk about the things that make them unique. And so we'll get more into that in a minute. So we need to know what animal, where that home is going to be, where. Um, what kinds of things does that animal need to live? Um, and so I'm just going to put needs right here. So I put animal wear and the needs of the animal. And we can get into some of the wants because our home does have a lot of the things that we want. You don't have to have a television to survive, but it's kind of fun. You don't have to have a video game, but it's kind of entertaining, isn't it? So think about some things that you might want or that animal might want, and this could be a lot of fun. Obviously, an animal doesn't typically have to have a bed, a traditional bed like with a pillow, but it's a home, so why not? Uh, we'll get into that too. How can this impact or influence the design? So if we're thinking about what animal, how is this going to influence the design? Uh, if you have an animal that swims, for example, you may need something underwater. Um, if you have an animal that runs fast, maybe there needs to be an exercise track. Um, if the animal's tall, like a giraffe has a long neck that's quite tall, or even an elephant, how might that influence the design that you are going to create? What kind of home are you going to create for this animal? So when you're thinking about each of these things, where? Um, if I was doing a home for a monkey, for example, perhaps because part of their um, existence in the wild would be a, in the treetops, maybe I would want to make a fancy treehouse. So these are things that impact or 
influence your design. And you're going to have to think about those a little bit. You're going to need to go through those steps before you actually design. Lots of thinking going on today. I like it. So, things to know. The things that you need to know today, here are some words. You know how we have our word wall when we're at school? It's a little bit like that. So these would be vocabulary words, things to know. Floor plan. We know what a floor is. It's what you walk on. But the floor plan for the plans for a building, because you call them a plan, uh, the floor plan is like a map. And when you know of a map, you, you're, what you know of a map is you're looking down on the map. And so you're going to see the exterior walls just like a line going around. You're going to see typically where windows and doors belong just by putting lines in. And um, you're just going to see it's like an aerial view, or we've talked about a bird's eye view before, if you remember that. Remember when we were doing our Thanksgiving plates, we talked about that. Perfect. You do? Okay. So elevation is the other word. And elevation is just a long, fancy word for renderings or, if you will, drawings of the exterior. Exterior is outside, interior means inside. So if we're doing the exterior, we're going to focus on the front elevation today. That would be the front of the house. But in true um, plans for a home, it's going to have an elevation for each side of the home. Front, back, and all the sides. So be thinking about that. You guys that are in third, fourth, and fifth grade, you might be creative enough to actually show each floor, each end of the building, and, and so forth. So I look forward to seeing these. Remember, you can post them on my blog, Mrs. Shirley's Art Spot, or you can just look on our um, website, White Station Elementary, and when you look at that, you will see our webpage and just click on my name and um, post it under the blog part or have your parents do that, of course. And I can't wait to see some of the photographs. Now, this is going to be a two-part lesson today. As you can tell, I'm wanting to see a floor plan and an elevation. You can pause it at any point and start back up when you're ready. Um, I love that about video, so that's the good part. All right, so moving forward with our animal architect design, I thought we might read a story today. Now, this is Eric Carl, and as you know, Eric Carl is one of my favorites mainly before, because of his illustrations, and we've done some painting like that before. But this is called A House for a Hermit Crab by Eric Carle. Oh, loving some of these colors. Making sure I've started the time to move, said Hermit Crab one day in January. I've grown too big for this little shell. He had felt safe and snug in his shell, but now it was too snug. Just like that. Yeah, too tight, too small. Hermit crab stepped out of the shell and onto the ocean floor, but it was frightening out in the open sea without a shell to hide in. What if a big fish comes along and attacks me, he thought. I must find a new house soon. Oh, I hope he's being careful. Early in February, Hermit Crab found just the house he was looking for. It was a big shell and strong. He moved right in, wiggling and waggling about inside it to see how it felt. It felt just right. But it looked so, well, so plain, thought Hermit Crab. In March, hermit crab met some sea anemones. They swayed gently back and forth in the water. How beautiful you are, said hermit crab. Would one of you be willing to come and live on my house? It's so plain. It needs you. I'll come, whispered the soft, small sea anemone. Gently, hermit crab picked it up with his claw and put it on his shell. In April, Hermit Crab passed a flock of starfish moving slowly along the sea floor. How handsome you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to decorate my house? I would, signaled a little sea star. 
Carefully, Hermit Crab picked it up with his claw and put it on his house. In May, Hermit Crab discovered some coral. They were hard and didn't move. How pretty you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to make my house more beautiful? I would creep the crusty coral. Gingerly, Hermit Crab picked it up with his claw and placed it on his shell. He's being ever so careful, isn't he? In June, Hermit Crab came to a group of snails crawling over a rock on the ocean floor. They grazed as they went, picking up algae and bits of debris and leaving a neat path behind them. How tidy and hardworking you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to come and help clean my house? I would, offered one of the snails. Happily, Hermit Crab picked it up with his claw and placed it on his shell. In July, Hermit Crab came across several sea urchins. They had sharp, prickly needles. How fierce you look, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to protect my house? I would, answered the spiky sea urchin. Carefully, Hermit Crab picked it up with his claw and placed it near his shell. In August, Hermit Crab and his friends wandered into a forest of seaweed. It's so dark here, thought Hermit Crab. How dim it is, murmured the sea anemone. How gloomy it is, whispered the starfish. How murky it is, complained the coral. I can't see, said the snail. It's like nighttime, cried the sea urchin. In September, Hermit Crab spotted a school of lanternfish darting through the dark water. How bright you are, said Kermit Crab. <laughs> would one of you be willing to light up our house? I would, replied one lanternfish, and it swam over near the shell. In October, Hermit Crab approached a pile of smooth pebbles. How sturdy you are, said Hermit Crab. Would you mind if I rearranged you? Not at all, answered the pebbles. Hermit Crab picked them up one by one with his claw and built a wall around his shell. Now my house is perfect, cheered Hermit Crab. He's got a little of everything, doesn't he? I think he's thought of it all. What do you think? But in November, Hermit Crab felt that his shell seemed a bit too small. Little by little over the year, Hermit Crab had grown. Soon he would have to find another bigger home. But he had come to love his friends. The sea anemone, the starfish, the coral, the sea urchin, the snail, the lanternfish, and even the smooth pebbles. They have been so good to me, thought Hermit Crab. They are like a family. How can I ever leave them? In December, in December, a smaller hermit crab passed by. I've outgrown my shell, she said. Would you like a place for me? Would you know of a place for me? I have outgrown my house too, answered hermit crab. I must move on. You are welcome to live here, but you must promise to be good to my friends. I promise, said the little crab. Oh, perfect. The little crab got a, an amazing home and taking care of the friends of the larger hermit crab. The following January, hermit crab stepped out and the little crab moved in. Couldn't stay in that little shell forever, said hermit crab as he waved goodbye. The ocean floor looked wider than he had remembered, but hermit crab wasn't afraid. Soon he spied the perfect house, a big, empty shell. It looked, well, a little plain, but sponges, he thought, barnacles, clownfish, sand dollars, electric eels. Oh, there are so many possibilities. I can't wait to get started. The end. So today, like hermit crab, we are thinking of a home for an animal. So we're gonna go through a process. Whenever you get tired, you may pause the video or fast forward through certain parts that are easier for you, of course. And we're gonna take a look at how to get started on this. So 
So looking forward to seeing your homes in parts two. All right, so we started by looking at the animal architect. Remember the things that you have to think about. You have to think about an animal, of course, and what do we need to know? What animal, where, and what it needs, and how can that influence our design? So brainstorming, let's see what we want to do with this. Architect checklist. So you're just going to check off every time you have done this brainstorming part. So the first thing is you're an animal architect and you this could change the meaning of a regular architect depending on what type of animal. And you'll know what I mean by that. We're going to think about what that animal needs, what it likes to eat. Um, where it likes to go, what kind of temperature it likes to be in, uh, um, climate in general. So let's take a look. First, we're going to look at who, and that is what animal you would like to do. We're also going to take a look at what, a home, a building, whatever it takes to um, make a place for that particular animal. When, now, unless that animal needs a specific season, something like that. Where? What is its habitat? What makes it work? What environment does it work best in? And you guys know that you've learned a lot of these things in your science classes um, and parts of the other um, architect part you need to do math, uh, especially if you're doing like perimeter and area and that kind of thing. So we're going to take a look now for why. Other things to consider temperature, optimal climate or surroundings. What does it eat? How does it get its food? So they give it hunt kind of thing. So here I've made a little chart. This might be helpful for you on your paper, but honestly, we all have brainstorming strategies, don't we? You probably already know the web design where you can put the animal in the middle and then they shoot out in different directions. You could do the Venn diagram where things are alike in different um, in different categories if you're doing a couple of animals. I would not do a home for multiple animals unless they live harmoniously, um, meaning together um, and kind of peaceful, or um, obviously same environment. That kind of thing. So be thinking about that. I know you are. All right. So examples. Here's an animal. I've written down cheetah, um, a cardinal, bird, but this could be any bird in your backyard more than likely. Uh, a macaw bird, kind of like a, a parrot, if you will, like in the wild. We're thinking about in the wild. Obviously, if you have a pet at home, a hamster, um, something like that, you could think about what they like. There's there's no rules about what animal or if it's a pet or not. So it could still work for you, but I really want your most creative ideas for this. Okay, penguin, polar bear, and frog. So I've just written a few ideas down get your juices, your brain juices going and flowing, and this will give you ideas for your actual floor plan. Remember, it's like a map, and your elevation, which is the outside view of your home, which is the fun part, I think, for some of you. All right, so we're going to be thinking about food, shelter. Remember, the word shelter is where it normally lives. How does it take shelter? Um, and some of those are confusing, so you have to think about it, and if it's confusing for you, also talk to a grown-up or an older brother or sister and see if they can help you out with some of those ideas. Safety, how does it keep safe? Camouflage in that example um, for some animals. And unique characteristics. And you may not have anything in that category, and you may. It just depends on the animal that you're creating. Uh, so let's start with the cheetah. So for the food, I put it eats meat, other animals like a gazelle, that kind of thing. Almost all animals need some type of water, so I included that as well. Um, it doesn't normally live in the water, so that's something to think about as well. Shelter, typically tall grass. Um, it likes to perch up or step up onto tall rocks so it can see its uh, enemies, predators coming uh, for it. And sometimes it will get in um, smaller trees. So what, how do we keep it safe? It's in danger from other large cats and hyenas, so you have to think about that a little bit. And then unique characteristic, it blends in, so it would camouflage in the tall grass, and it's very fast and lean. 
uh, lean is kind of thin and, and maybe muscular in other areas, but it's a smaller um, cast, if you will. All right, so if I were thinking of a home, I would take those ideas and try to put them together. For example, the home would probably be on the savanna, um, African savanna and tall grass. Um, maybe there are some smaller trees or rocks, or maybe I would um, perch my building up like it would be on a, a small rock or tree. Um, I would think about its need for exercise and running. Maybe it has a running track around the edge. I would think about keeping it safe from hyenas and other large cats. So when I'm designing the home, those are things that I think about. Do you see how you're going about your brainstorming now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So cardinal likes worms, bugs, and other kinds of insect that needs water. Um, it nests in trees and it perches, like it, you'll see them sitting up on um, fences, things like that, rooftops. Um, and of course, what keeps it safe is in danger from other birds, raccoons, cats, things like that. And the unique characteristics, it's red, it's, it's got a feathered tuft on top of its head, um, those things. Macaw, it eats fruits, nuts, seeds, leaves, flowers, plants. Um, and it needs a little water as well. And it also likes a clay lick, at least the Amazon uh, macaws do. And um, that's believed to give it some nutrients and minerals it needs also to buffer its stomach. Um, then shelter is going to be in the forest, holes in the trees, um, in the cliffs or banks. And keep in mind when we say forest, forest could also be a rainforest. So jungle like, yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. Larger birds of prey or its, uh, its enemies, snakes, monkeys, all of those could harm um, or eat um, that particular bird. And of course, it's a concern of conserving it in the wild. It's slightly endangered. Uh, penguins, we know about penguins, don't we? So they eat fish, mostly fish, but some of them eat squid and krill, which are almost shrimp-like creatures. Uh, they live in the ocean in the southern hemisphere. They don't all live where it's cold, so that's um, something to think about. And some are a little more colorful than just black and white. They typically are in colonies, <coughs> and they live in pairs. Um, so it's mate and it live in a pair. Now, they are in danger sometimes from other animals, and keep in mind that the males also incubate the eggs, so the male and the female do that. Um, polar bears, they eat meat. Typically, they live where, obviously, where it's cold. Um, they blend in with the um, environment, and they are somewhat endangered as well. So, I'm giving you really brief things now. You can always look up a specific animal and get more information. That's called investigating, and that's part of brainstorming as well, and I look forward to seeing that. And the last one I did was frogs. Now, we know that there are many different types of frog. You could do something like a tree frog. I did just your traditional frog that is in fresh water, like a little pond or a lake, something like that. So this one depends on the type of frog, but the one that I did would eat bugs and worms. And um, if it's a larger frog, it might even eat some small mice, small turtles, and small frogs. Um, it shelters in an aquatic place, which means it's going to be damp or wet. It doesn't necessarily live in the water, um, except for early in its life cycle, yeah, when it's a tadpole, um, but it does need to be near the water. Its um, skin needs that. And so typically you'll see them sheltering in the mud, on the banks, or near water. So you'll see it in lakes, in ponds, and even streams, um, and wetlands. So wetlands where there's a, it's very moist and wet. Um, obviously, things to think about for safety. When it's a tadpole, they're very vulnerable, um, and they're typically on the banks. And you know that the tadpoles grow and change. And so that might be something to think about in the home. And the unique characteristics, it has protruding eyes that stick out so it can kind of see around um, a long tongue so it can capture its prey. And typically they're speckled, so they'll blend in or camouflage with their surroundings. And then it can make some noises like croaking, um, and we typically think of it as a ribbit sound. Um, and so they do jump a little bit. Those black legs have that sound too. 
So once you brainstorm, you're actually going to be ready for the construction part. So let's see how that's going to work. Now, I have designed a frog home here. And so the first thing I, I did was I worked on the elevation. Do you remember what the elevation means? Think of it. Yeah, it's the exterior. It's the, the outside view of the home. And this is a front elevation. And that's all I'm concerned with, especially with my younger um, artists. Now, if you're an older artist, you might want to um, push yourself a little bit further and see if you can do the side elevations and the back elevation because that is truly what a plan for a home would look like. So we're going to start with the elevation and how you would do that is think about how you want the outside of your home to look. It can look traditional, it could be castle-like, it could be, I don't want to say invisible, but it could have some clear parts to it or transparent parts to it. Um, it could be made of multiple materials. For example, if I were doing an animal that um, lived in the ocean or on the beach, like a crab, I could do a sand castle. Um, it's going to look like a castle, but the intent is to use the things that you have around you. So we usually build with supplies that are readily available, that are easy to find near there. So it needs to be something that um, you might see. So for this frog home, it looks like a person's home. You can see in the window, it looks like the frog is in the kitchen here cooking. We see the bank, that's the land. We see the water right here. And below the water, we can even see some dirt and some um, water plants growing, some rocks and some other animals that live near there. Um, you see a little walkway that goes across, little stepping stones and a walkway going across to the door. We can see through this window, so we do see a frog. We see a deck back here with a table. And look, there's a little slide, and this frog is sliding in about to take a swim into the lake. Now, when you look down below the water, you notice that this home goes below the water. Hmm, probably because frogs like those kind of um, environments. And then we see this clear glass bubble like part with some stairs coming down. It looks like a little playroom. I see some tadpoles hanging out in there. You could even make a little baby bed or crib because that's supposed to be the baby frog, isn't it? Okay, so this would be an excellent use for a front elevation. Let's take a look at the floor plan part. So when you look at the floor plan, notice we see a rectangle because if we took the roof off and we look straight down from a bird's eye view, it's going to look like a map. So this is a map of the house. This floor plan shows a big rectangle because that looks like a rectangle from the top. And we can see where you walk in. Notice that the doors are just marked with two little lines like that. And that shows a doorway. Some people will even put a little line in there um, to look like the door is opening. Remember, it's a top view. So we walk into the home and we see to the right a little bug net room. So that must be like a, your pantry. That's where they keep their um, dinner. So they have some a place to put their food. We see a little living room here with a, a couch and a chair and a rug and a television. And yes, we know that a frog doesn't need a television, but it's kind of fun to have um, be the architect for the frog's home. You see a little doorway here, some stairs here. This one goes out onto the deck. We can see the top of the table. We can see the top of the slide. All of this would be water around it, of course. Like in a regular home, it might be grass. Okay, here's the, the bottom floor. That would be this one right here under the water. We see the adult's bedroom. And of course, in a lot of home plans, it's going to say master, master bedroom or master bath. And um, that is not something I put in here was a bathroom, but you could, of course, like have a tub and a sink. Here, I've got two little beds. This is the kid's bedroom. And there's the place where the stairs from upstairs come down. And there's the place where these stairs go down to the glass bubble. And notice on the glass bubble, it shows a few little lines because that's how you can swim out. See in the glass bubble here, there's a little hole and he's got a ladder he can climb out and he can go swim around and then come back up because remember, the tadpoles are in there. So there's probably some water in there as well. So the glass bubble nursery playroom. See how that could work for a frog. I love it. So I know you guys are going to have some amazing ideas, but I just want to give you a couple of tips before I go. And remember, this is a two-part lesson. You're going to be doing an elevation and a floor plan. So 
So after you brainstorm for your animal, um, let's say you're trying to draw elevation. Here's some tips. When you're drawing, I would first of all use a ruler. Look how much better. See, I did a rectangle there. Let me do one here, and I'll show you the difference. It's going to look just a little nicer and neater. But you're welcome to just draw rectangles and squares if you need to. So when you're drawing buildings, typically they're just a series, like a home is just a series of rectangles, different sizes, um, widths, that kind of thing. Sometimes you have triangle-shaped roof. Sometimes you have like a trapezoid or another shape. So I'm going to make both of these look really similar. And then I'm going to put like a little, maybe on top of this one, you know how some houses have porches. So I'm doing a little triangle on top. I'm trying to make that dark enough for you guys to see. And so we call those dormers. So I'm going to put a window. Keep in mind windows can be rectangular with the crisscross panes like um, a T-shaped cross, and it can have as many window panes as you want. Or you've all seen the type of homes that have these angular windows that look like diamond-shaped panes, and this is why I say those look better with a ruler. Um, and then, of course, you have windows that can be um, semicircle shaped. Some of them have these little wedge-shaped, pie-shaped parts in there. Some of those are also in side of um, doors, you'll see a little window um, like that as well. And keep in mind that some windows are the long rectangular shape, um, whatever you decide. So we'll put more panes in this one. All right, and windows sometimes have shutters on the edge. Right here, I'm doing what you call an arch window. That means it's curved at the top. And then this is a little roof line here. We're going to put a little porch over this part, which means there'll be columns on the side, two little parts here. I'm going to put one of these vents in here, but it could easily be a window. Um, here, I'm going to do a circular window and a rectangular window here um, coming down from this point. Um, we have a couple of stairs. Stairs from the front will look just like a rectangle. And then if you want them to go out, make each rectangle get longer. If you want some posts, some handrails, you can put those in there. Remember, they're from the front. So I'm going to do a double door here, which means I just put a line in the middle. And I'm going to put a little window in the door. Long rectangular windows here. And we'll make this a garage. Put some lines there. And maybe another window up here above the garage. Some lights. You could put some light features. You know how you have lights outside. Or a little pathway. Something like that. So this would be, hopefully you can see it also. So hopefully you can see the same part. And I'm going to take some of these same ideas and make them tassels. And then I can put parts on top. Maybe a little table would work for that too. You know, some castles have this part, but some castles have, they have this triangular part with a little flag. Um, some of them have this part where the archers or other people can stand and see, but they're still protected. So you could have a big drawbridge, you know, across here. What would I use a castle for? I'm thinking like even a cheetah, that might be kind of neat because it has a tall place it can look out and kind of keep safe from the larger cat. And it could lower its um, door so that it keeps it safe inside. But a castle could be pretty tall as well. And so I'm thinking that that might be interesting to see. Um, it might be interesting to see some tall animals that would be in there. For example, um, a giraffe or an elephant. Now, what I love about a castle is because we think about sand castles. So it, a desert could be a sand castle. So an animal that lives in the desert, maybe something like um, a camel could be in, in that have a sand castle. Or it could be something on the beach where you're making fun, like a starfish, if you're making a home for a starfish. Um, 
use your imagination and have fun with this. Remember, once you've drawn this part, you're thinking about, oh, that's the top floor, that's the bottom floor, and you're making that. This little part looks round, so if I'm making a floor plan design for that, um, when I look at that, I'm gonna see top floor rectangle, bottom floor looks bigger. I see the garage part, and there's a little part above the garage. I see this round part up here, and maybe downstairs. So you basically have first floor and a second floor. Be thinking about where the windows are located. And you put those in, like if it's a door, you just put two little lines like this. Some people will put the little line like that to make it look like a door, but it's not necessary. So where you have the porch right here, you could put the path because you're looking down on it. Um, and you can show windows the same way, but you do that typically like a little rectangle when you're doing the windows. Now, I cannot wait to see all of your animal creations. Um, architects, are you ready? I know you are. So next, I'm going to see designs, and most of you are just going to do your brainstorming. Think of some animals. That might take you one day. That's fine. So take a little break, and then when you come back to it, pick your favorite or maybe a couple and start sketching your front elevation. And I'm gonna go back to that just to remind you. So your front elevation is gonna be your picture, remember? And then I want to see your floor plan. So this could be a three-part process if you want. Pause it at any time or rewind it or fast forward if you are a little more advanced than that. So I know that my kindergarten and first graders, I'm looking forward to just seeing your animal's home and how you thought about where it could be. If you're having trouble with the map part, remember the floor plan, then make put all of your effort into the elevation and your creation that way. Uh, my third, fourth, and fifth grade, um, even my second graders for that matter, I know that you are capable of doing the elevation and the floor plan. I should see lots of details from my fourth and fifth graders. Um, looking forward to seeing your construction zone and hey, perhaps your finished part, we might need a realtor to sell that, right? Have a great Afternoon. Looks like it's going to rain here today, so it's the perfect day for doing some designing. See you next time. Bye.